Uh, let's see. And uh, so the next talk will be uh, about uh, by Peter on uh, anions, split property, and long range entanglement. So Peter. yes, yes. Thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. So it's said that um, we cannot be in Stony Brook because I, I already always enjoyed it there. But uh, it's nice that we have this virtual uh, conference um, now at least. Uh, yeah, so I slightly changed the, changed the title of my talk, so uh, I dropped the split property, uh, so I might have some time to talk about it at the end. Um, but yeah, so what I'm going to talk about today is, is sort of an overview of work uh, joined with, uh, well, of a series of work uh, joined with uh, Mathieu Cha, uh, Meander Fiedre, uh, Bruno Nachtel, and Yoshiko Agata. Um, so... Uh, today, I, I basically want to talk about this part of the title of, of the workshop. So, so what's the, the type of question that I'm interested in? Well, I'm interested in the classification of, of gapped contour phases. So I'm going to give a, an imprecise definition here. I will later uh, refine this, uh, basically. So we can start with some self-adjoint operator, positive self-adjoint operator, the Hamiltonian on the Hilbert space. We have a ground state. And we're going to assume that there is a spectral gap. So there's a gap in the, in the energy spectrum. Uh, so that's, that's, of course, what the gap refers to. And then we say two states are in the same phase if they can be connected by a continuous path of Hamiltonians like this. So in itself, this is not a very interesting definition. So typically, we want some, uh, some conditions on the type of Hamiltonians that we will allow. Right? Otherwise, this is uh, more or less trivial. Um, so yeah, so the question is, what are interesting phases and can we find invariants of phases so we can classify, well, classify them, right? So in particular as a mathematician, I want you to get some new concept and the first thing you want to do is classify them. Um, so, so that's more or less the setting. So hopefully uh, since you signed up all for this workshop, you have some idea why this is an interesting problem. Um, I hope hopefully this will become clear later as well. So what I want to talk about, so the type of phases I want to talk about um, are, are topologically ordered phases. So I don't think there's a consistent definition in the literature. So let me try to sort of indicate what I want, what I well, what I'm interested in. Um, so, so, so there's a question in the chat, I see. So the, how are states related to the Hamiltonians? So the states are the ground states of the Hamiltonian. Uh, yeah. So uh, this will become clear later on. Um, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. So, so, um, so typically we're, we're interested in, in the local uh, system. So where the Hamiltonians are local in the sense that I will make clear later. And the first classification that you can sort of make is into short range entangled and long range entangled states. Um, so the short range entangled states, uh, I think we're going to hear more about them later this week. So I, I won't talk about too much about them. So in, for example, in 1D, this is the most interesting class. And so there's some topological features here and they often arise because there are some symmetries in the system. The type of systems that I want to talk about today are called long range entangled or sometimes people call it intrinsic topological order. Uh, and a well-known example is, is the toric code that, that we'll uh, show later. So it's not going to be very clear in my talk where the topology comes in, but uh, these models typically have a ground space degeneracy. So you can define your model on a, uh, on a surface on a compact surface and then the dimension of the ground uh, state space of the, of the Hamiltonian uh, depends on the topology on the genus of the surface. So you and don't one of the, ground state. Sorry, yes? You don't have a unique ground state in your definition. Uh, no, no, um, no. So later I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about infinite systems and there, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, there is usually a unique ground state, but um, that will come later. Um, but yeah, so, so you can define these models on, on, different, uh, on different systems and, and typically indeed the ground state is non-unique and depends on the topology. So that's, that's a 
particular uh, interesting features. So one of the things that I'm interested in is that these models, they have quasi-particle excitations uh, called anions. So I, I will define that later for those who are not familiar with this. And that's, uh, so, so these are generalizations of bosons and fermions. Uh, so so that's, that's what I'm interested in. So what I want to uh, discuss today is, um, is a, uh, well, a framework to study these anionic quasi-particles. So for the experts, uh, under us, so, so these, these, the, the properties of these anionic quasi-particles, they can be described by moderate tensor categories. It's not too important what it is now. Um, but yeah, so the idea is essentially, and that, that's the idea I'm going to develop in this talk, is that this moderate tensor category is going to be an invariant of the phase. So that's 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 what I want to prove. Um, yeah. So let me first uh, take a step back and and make more precise these definitions that I said before. So what's a quantum phase, and in particular in this operator algebraic framework. So this is basically, so for simplicity, I'm going to consider uh, 2D systems on, on a square lattice. It, it doesn't matter so much uh, what the underlying uh, uh, lattice is, but um, yeah, so we have a, a system and each of these sides of the, of the lattice, I have some finite dimensional quantum spin system. So let's say described by a D-dimensional algebra. So a, a spin, a spin D if you want. Yeah. What is the, yeah. All right, so that's um, that's a setting you should keep in mind. So how do we describe such a system? Well, the thing is for each, for, uh, we can, so this is, this is a local system. So to each uh, part of my, of my letter, so I take a subset of sides, so these yellow dots are the sides. So it, if this is finite, I can associate this algebra to it. So I take the d by d matrices uh, and I take the tensor product of all um, uh, over all the sides. So I have uh, just a collection of spins. So the nice thing is, is the local structure that I mentioned. So we can see this in, in two ways. Well, this uh, arises in, in, in different ways. So, so one of the Nice features. So if we take, for example, this subset of sides, this gives me an algebra, a lambda one. So that's a uh, so a finite dimensional algebra. And then if I take a bigger set containing the first one, so that's called a lambda two, then there's a natural inclusion of the smaller algebra into the bigger algebra, namely what we do. So all the new sites that I add, I just tensor with the identity matrix. So this gives me an inclusion of algebras. And what you then can easily see is that if I have two disjoint sets, so let's say here and here, then these two algebras commute into a suitable, well, in a suitable bigger algebra. So that's the locality property. So what you can do then is take the union of all of these, of all of these things and make it into a nice C star algebra. So there's a, a, a the, well, the well-known norm on this algebra. This induces a norm on this one. So if you take the completion, we get C star algebra. So I'm not going to talk uh, a lot about the C star algebraic properties. So most of it is, is going to be more or less algebraic in my talk. Um, but yeah, it, it has some nice properties, but the physical interpretation of this is this describes all operations that you can do on your system um, well that you can approximate arbitrarily well so that that means the closure basically with with the local operations so by acting on a finite part of your system because this only acts on finite parts of the system so that's as a physically uh, interesting uh, well physically well-defined uh, interpretation i would say um, all right so that's that's the sister algebra so Unlike in the previous talk, basically in my talk, the C-star algebra is fixed and it's, it's very general. I didn't have any physical input basically. So if you want to describe a concrete physical system, what we can do is we can introduce local Hamiltonians describing the dynamics. So this local Hamiltonian is a, 
is a silver joint uh, element in, in the local algebra. And this, this describes the interactions in, the, in our finite part of the system. So of course, this has to be consistent with, uh, well, you have to define this in a consistent way. Um, but once you do this, you can describe uh, dynamics, well, this into, into, uh, induced dynamics on our system. So that's how the physics comes in in, in, this, uh, in this picture. So indeed, if they are sufficiently local or they, well, they decay fast enough, the interaction between far away sides, what you get is a one parameter group of automorphisms of my C star algebra. So this is the physical time evolution. Um, so once you have one parameter groups, of, well, strongly contains one parameter group of the real numbers, then it's possible to define a ground state in this algebraic setting. Um, so that's in terms of this derivation that we, that we saw earlier. Um, I'm not going to write down the definition here because it's not, uh, it's not too important for the rest of my talk. But uh, yeah, so my point is we can, we can define a ground state in this algebraic setting. All right, um, so now we have an abstract C star algebra. We have a, a, a state on the C star algebra. So this is a linear functional that's positive. Uh, so what does it have to do with this picture I showed in the beginning, right? Because I was talking about Hamiltonians on my Hilbert space. Well, what you can do once you have a C star algebra and a state on them, on it, you can do what's called the GNS representation after Gelfan, Neimark and, and uh, Siegel. So what this does is it gives a representation of our algebra on, onto a Hilbert space uh, so that's that you can construct. And moreover, this, this state is, is represented by a unit vector in your Hilbert space. And moreover, because we have a ground state, you can show that there is a, a, a typically unbounded self joint operator on this, uh, on this Hilbert space that implements the dynamics in, induced by, by these local Hamiltonians. So this gives us, uh, well, puts us back in, our, in the original picture where I have a, an unbounded self joint operator. And what I'm interested in is that this Hamiltonian uh, should be capped uh, once we do this procedure. All right, so that's, that's the type of models that I'm interested in. So that's a single state. I'm not in so much interested in a single state, but in a, uh, in a phase, so a collection of states of an equivalence class. So uh, Peter, that's, yes. Excuse me, just one sec. Can you write the gap condition in terms of uh, state omega, just for everybody to? And then, uh, yeah, so um, it's, it, so uh, now I have to think. So, um, so yeah, so you, you, you can write it in terms of the derivation of the, of the C star algebra of the, um, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's, that's, uh, that's very helpful, but, um, it's, it means that this, um, operator is, is, uh, has a gap. So in general, it's, it's very difficult to prove that this indeed holds. So, uh, in particular, in terms of this, this local Hamilton. So if these all have a uniform gap, then you can show that this has a uniform gap, but, um, uh, it's it's yeah it's it's in, in general a very difficult difficult question, um, and I think we're going to uh, maybe hear a bit more about this later this week. Uh, so I don't want to uh, spend too much time on that. Um, all right. So so before I was talking about uh, well phases of of states where I had this this part of Hamiltonians. So th this is a different. Uh, uh, this is a different picture that's uh, sort of equivalent, but not, not exactly. So I'm saying that two states are in the, in, the, in the same state. If I can find a finite depth quantum circuit that maps one to another. So I'm going to draw the 1D picture here because it gets more complicated in 2D. So here I have now a chain of quantum spins. I have a state on this. What I can do is I can apply unitary operators. So my blue blocks are unitary operators. So in each layer of this uh, of this map, I uh, I apply 
uh, these joint unitary operators, so they act in different parts of the system. And I only apply finitely many, um, finitely many uh, of these of these of these blocks. So that's 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 what the finite depth uh, refers to. So what you what we see from this picture is this a sort of that it's, this is very local. So if we take, for example, this block of spins, then the effect of this of, of a prior in this map, it well, it spreads out a bit, but only in a limited way. So so the effect of this is, is something uh, that so the the image of, of an operator in here is going to be in, in this in this algebra, which is slightly larger. So so this. Um, so this is in the physics literature. This is this is used as a, one of the definitions of of a phase. So two states are in the same phase if I can transform them in this way. But this is a is a rather uh, finite dimensional picture, right? So it's not very natural if you look at the C star algebraic uh, things where you would want to look, for example, at maybe limits of these kind of things. So uh, in the uh, strong op in the, in the strong operator support. Um, so I'm going to use a slightly different definition, which is sort of a, uh, well, a, the, the, it's basically the appropriate notion for this infinite setting. So I'm going to illustrate this with this theorem. So before we had this, uh, well, the definition was, uh, well, we had this, this part of Hamiltonians. All right, so that's, um, so we're going to have this now again. So now I have my local Hamiltonians and I'm going to add some perturbation to it. And I'm going to assume that, that this perturbation doesn't close the spectral gap. Again, this is typically very difficult to prove that it doesn't do that, but there are some results in this direction. So what this, what this, what this theorem says is that, that well, so, so I want, so according to my original definition, I want these two states to be in the same phase. So if I have a ground state of, of something of a phi zero, well, of a S is zero uh, and one of S is one, then I want them to be in the same phase. So what this theorem tells us that there's a family of automorphisms, such that the weak star limits of ground states with open boundary conditions are related by this uh, condition. So let me briefly explain what I mean with this. So what we do is we took a look at the finite part of the system. For a finite part, we have this local Hamiltonian. So we can define a ground state for the finite part of the system. And then we just grow and grow the system and we get a state on the big system, which you can show as a ground state. And these, these are the weak star limits of ground states. So this theorem tells that they are related according to this way. So yes. I missed it, what big S is. Yes, so th this big S is the, the set of uh, of ground states that are weak star limits of, of finite dimensional ground states. Okay. So that's, yeah. Um, so this gives us a, Sorry, a way to, yes. So your definition of ground state is uh, what? Weak star limit um, of ground states for, so, for finite so, um, dimensional things or what, what is it? So, so the limit of, of ground states to find dimensional things, they are ground states in, in, the, in the definition that I'm using. So that's um, your definition? Defi yes, so the definition okay. of, a, of a ground state, so let me just write it down, is a state that satisfies uh, this. Uh, I'm not sure if this is very readable like this, but mm. um, no, okay. Let me write it on, on this, sorry. Let me write it on this one. Is that better or is it still too dark? Yep. Yep. Okay. So a ground state is something that satisfies uh, this, where this is the. Uh, okay, for, for any A from the local C star algebra. So, yeah, so, so oh. I, will write, I will write this down. So, so delta is the derivation implementing um, this one parameter group automorphism, and this A is in. The domain of the derivation. So, so typically for for um, for these these systems, if you if you uh, okay. if your uh, Hamiltonian is, is sufficiently local, then you can obtain it in this way. So you take a local operator, 
je tekende commentator met die, uh, met die logo Ramon Tonius en je tekende alleen maar toen. Ja, zo. Ja, zo that's my definition. So, so, okay. so, yeah. so, so user ground state of finance systems, they, they, they need to uh, ground state of a big system in this way, but not, not necessarily all the. Uh, so. so, if you play with the boundary conditions, you can get different ground states. Um, all right, so that's, uh, yeah, so, so what's, what's the important part? So this alpha S has, has, has very nice properties, namely it's a, uh, a quasi-local map. So, um, so what do we mean with this? Well, they satisfy a Lee Robinson type of bound. So this is a Lee Robinson bound. Um, if you've never seen this before, it's, it's maybe not very illuminating, but the point is that if I have uh, some operator A here, and some operator B that are uh, far away. So of course they commute. But now I apply my map alpha A to this one. And they don't necessarily commute anymore, but the commutator can be bounded with this formula. And this is a function that, that decays uh, fast enough in the support of, uh, of this. So X is the support of A and Y is the support of of B, so A, uh, so, sorry, I should have written that down, but A is in A, X, and B is in B. So if this, the, the case, uh, so we want this to decay fast enough, for example, exponentially. So that's that's a uh, sort of an infinite dimensional analog of, of this finite, finite depth quantum circuit. So here we don't, Assume that that our a well is, is strictly local alpha a, but um, we we allow for some some exponential decaying error. So um, yeah. So that's that's now how we can define define phases by by states that are related in this way. Uh, uh, well, using this this uh, this uh, like uh, local maps. All right, so let me get uh, to the different part now. So I wanted to talk about anions. So what's an anion? Well, this, this is a sort of a cartoonish picture, but um, what you can think of is you can have two uh, quasi-particle excitations like this, and you take one around the other and back. So in 2D, then this is a topologically non-trivial operation, right? Because I cannot contract this loop. So, uh, so this was realized uh, well, already some time ago that, that this can lead to, uh, lead to interesting situations. So if you would have two bosons or two fermions, moving one around the other is the same as doing nothing, right? Because for a boson, um, interchanging two, two particles uh, doesn't, change, doesn't change anything. And for a fermion, you get a minus sign. So moving one around the other is the same as interchanging twice. So in that case, nothing happens. But for the anions, we have something more interesting, namely we have a phase vector, or for the non-abelian case, instead of a phase vector, you can have some unitary uh, operation. All right, so, so what does this have to do with well, before? So, um, so the, these models that I'm interested in, they have these anionic uh, excitations, and as I claimed in the beginning, these should be an invariant of the phase. So um, I don't want to say too much about this, but but the, the thing is we can there's there's a nice algebraic structure in terms of moderate tensor categories behind these anions. So we can uh, describe, for example, the exchanging of anions corresponds to a braiding in a tensor category. Um, so yeah, so so I don't want to say too much about this, just that. There is this, this algebraic structure of a model tensor category that describes that encodes all the different properties of the anions. So now we are faced with the questions. Well, how do we, I have my, my system. So somebody gives me some local Hamiltonian. How do I get this model tensor category, right? That's, and is this indeed an invariant? So if I take a state in the same phase, can I get this model tensor category again? And more importantly, do I get the same one? 
And then in the end, if there's some time left, I will talk about what does this do with long range entanglement. All right, so one way to get this, this category is through Doppelgeraad Roberts uh, sector theory. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the properties of all the anions. And this we can do using this definition. So what I'm doing is I start with, so I have my, my ground state of my get Hamiltonian, uh, which I call omega zero. And then as I explained, we can get a representation pi of zero associated to this, this one. So what I'm now I'm going to do is I'm going to look at all representations uh, pi such that when I restrict to the algebra of observables outside of a given cone. Um, so, uh, so let me let me draw a picture here. So I can draw a cone like this on my 2D lattice. And I can look at the algebra of everything that's generated by everything outside of this cone. And that's what I call a uh, lambda C. So lambda is the cone. So I'm going to look at all representations that are equivalent to my ground state representation um, outside of this cone. So unitary equivalence. Um, and I want this to hold for each cone and lambda. So not for a single cone, but I want to hold this to hold for all, all cones. Uh, lambda. So that's, that's, that's quite restrictive in general. So in typically not many representations will satisfy it. Which is a good thing because well, there are very many Inequivalent representations of a C star algebra, but most of them are not physically interesting. So, my claim is representations that satisfy this, they are the physically interesting ones. Um, and I want to give a brief physical interpretation of, of this criterion. So, first, it encodes basically two different properties. So, first is charge conservation. So, local operators cannot change the, the total charge. So I didn't explain what a charge is, but um, a charge is nothing else than a label for, uh, for the sector or the equivalence class of unitary of, of irreducible representations that satisfy this thing. So that's what I call a charge or, or an anion. So they, the anions correspond to equivalence classes of such representations. And well, because they're inequivalent, if you have two inequivalent representations, that's, that's uh, more, uh, that, that's, uh, that basically means that, that you cannot change, you cannot go from one representation to another with a local operator. That's, for, that's what it means, well, that follows from them being in equivalent. The second is this localization of the charges in cones. So I can, this, I have this, that outside of the, uh, outside of this cone lambda that that shows, my, my, my representation looks like the, like the vacuum representation, the ground state representation. So, so basically this means that I can localize my anion inside this cone and lambda. And the last one is the transportability. So I can move this cone around because my cation has to hold for all the cones and lambda uh, at the same time. With a different unitary, of course. Uh, all right, so let me, let me give you a, uh, an example of this. So this is the Tory code. It's maybe familiar to many of you, but let me briefly explain this. So now my model is not defined on these vertices, but on the on the edges. So my quantum spin systems are on the edges. It doesn't really matter so much. Uh, it's slightly more convenient here. I have a local Hamiltonian. So I take what I do is so my system is just qubits on each edge. So just two-dimensional systems on each edge and I can act with a sigma x power x matrix on each of these uh, among a square. I can do the same with this one and my local Hamiltonians are sums of all these operators. That's my local Hamiltonian. So it's, fairly, it's a fairly simple Hamiltonian because well, first of all, all these, all these operators, they commute with each other because they will always have an even number of, of edges in common and the power matrix is anti-commute. So we can diagonalize them exactly in a finite settings and 
So that's, that's, that's a quite a simple model. And what you can again show is that if you take an operator like this, which is called a string operator. So what I do is I take a, I draw a path on my letters. And uh, along this path, I act with my poly X matrix. So what you can show, because this entire commutes with this operator and on this one, you'll see if you work it out, you'll see there's an energy penalty at the end of these, these string operators because of the anti-commutation with this so a minus sign uh, changes to a plus sign basically. So we can think of, of, of acting with this on the ground state, you can think of creating an excitation here and one excitation there. And these are going to be our anions. So now I have a pair of anions. Uh, I'm interested in a single anion. So what I do is I just send this one off to infinity. So I just basically take the limit of this part going bigger and bigger all the way to infinity. So that's the reason why it's useful to work in this infinite setting. So what you get, what you get then is you can define a map of my sister algebra. So this F psi n are these, these string operators that I just mentioned. So conjugation with this, uh, with this string of power X operators. So this defines an automorphism of your sister algebra. And the interpretation of the state that I get, so this is my ground state, I compose it with this automorphism. And this is a single excitation state where we only have this anion sitting at this, at the end of the string, because the other one went off all the way to infinity. So we cannot, we cannot see it anymore. In sense. So just as an aside, so the topological property comes in because, well, I can send this in to, uh, in, to infinity in different ways and they all turn out to give you the same state basically. Um, yeah, so, so we can look at the GNS representation. Uh, which is... All right, so this, is, this should be a single anion state. And um, what you can show is this, this state or this representation actually satisfies this selection criterion that I just mentioned. So the locality is clear from the construction. Um, so th so that, that's for this fixed column lambda, but it's true for any column lambda. And that comes from this property that I just mentioned that uh, if I take a string in a different direction, I get the same state. That's, that's less obvious, but uh, it's not too difficult to show. So this, this row has this property, so it's localized, so it acts non-trivially outside of this cone and it's transportable. So if I take a different cone, I get a unitary equivalent representation. So if I send, send it off in a different direction, it's unitary equivalent. So what you can do is then you can study all the endomorphisms that has these FD2 property, these two properties. So this one localized and transportable. So these are the conditions that I impose. And this always with respect to this representation by zero. So basically why, why I want to do this is now I'm going from representations of my C-star algebra to endomorphisms of the C-star algebra. And that's, that's very, very nice because, well, endomorphisms have much more structure than, than representations. So for example, one thing that we can do is we can compose two of these endomorphisms and we get a new endomorphism. And this actually corresponds to the physical operation, what's called fusion. So um, you bring two anions together and you can decompose this again into irreducibles. All right, so, um, so the point is that, that we can study all these endomorphisms to satisfy this property. And what do we get then? So for this is for example, for Kitaev's Abelian quantum double model, which is a generalization of the Tory code, then uh, you can give this, this set of endomorphisms uh, a structure of a moderate tensor category, which is the representation category of the quantum double of a group. So this is some quasi triangular Hopf algebra. This is this moderate tensor category. Um, yeah. And from the construction, these, so these are all the anions. So what, we do, what we've done is this, this procedure gives us from very few assumptions. So basically the only thing that I have to start with is my representation. And I have to find all representations that satisfy the selection criterion. I can recover the full 
tensor category describing these anions. So uh, the braiding, fusion, etc., etc. So all, all properties that are relevant of the anions. So um, of course I don't have time to go into the details here, but um, but yeah. So so my, my my point is that there's very few assumptions that I actually have to make for this theory to work. All right. So this was with respect to a single phase. I, I had to choose my representation uh, by not, and then I looked at all these representations satisfied the criteria. So what happens if I perturb my system? Is this, um, so, so there are two questions that we have to answer. So first of all, does the gaps st stay open and how are the states related? So I mentioned already this, this theorem earlier by, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, um, Bachmann, uh, Michel Arkes, uh, Nachtigall, and Sims. It is alpha S. So, so we know how the states are related. Does this transfer to the sector theory? The answer is, is yes. Um, so basically what, what, what this means is, so this is the category once we start perturbing. So we have this perturbation that I called phi S earlier. I start perturbing my ground state. What I can show is that but what we showed is that um, if we have a new state, we can again define uh, the, uh, the super selection criterion or something similar at least, and we get the same category as the ones that we started. So this looks like a sort of trivial because we had an automorphism connecting our states and I defined everything in terms of, um, well, of things of uh, endomorphisms of the C-star algebra. So um, it looks like it's kind of trivial um, but the issue is once you do this, this analysis of the sector theory, you actually have to go to von Neumann algebra. So this is more common for the experts. Um, so it doesn't, it's not enough to work on the C-star algebra levels. You have to go to weak closures. And uh, there the situation is, is less clear. But what this shows is that, that indeed this, this category is an invariant of the case. Once I start perturbing it, but keep the gap open, I get the same result. All right. So I see Ulrich has a, a question. I will come to that uh, soon. Um, so I, I briefly want to come to, to the point. So what does this do with the long range entanglement that I, uh, that I had in the title? So there's a full call saying, so topological order, and in particular, the existence of this anion of excitations is due to long range entanglement. Um, so let me try to briefly explain that uh, in my, uh, five minutes or so that I still have. Um, so let me first explain what long range entanglement is. So what I can do is I can divide my system into two parts. So for example, I take my cone and the complement, and then I can write my C algebra as a tensor product of these two things. So then I can look at product states with respect to these cones. And so these states, they only have classical correlations between this cone and this one. So no quantum correlations. So this is what, uh, what's called a separable state uh, in, the, in the literature. So, so what does it mean to be uh, so a separable state is, what, is a state that's not entangled. That, that's, 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 that's important part. So, so, when, so we say, what I say, what I now can say is well, a state is long range entangled. If I cannot find a, uh, quasi local automorphism A alpha. So that's an automorphism that satisfies this Lip Robinson type of bound. So if I cannot transform my state into a product state like this, I'm saying it's long range entangled. So, of course, it's, it's very important that this automorphism is quasi local because for the algebras that we have here, all the pure states can be connected by an automorphism like this, but in general, it will be highly non local. So so in one dimensional systems, the gap current states are not long range entangled. So you can always uh, transform them into product states, but in 2D, 2D this is different. Um, so yeah, so what we can, can do is, okay, so what, what happens if my state is not long range entangled? Does this mean I don't have any anions? Because that, that's, that's what seems to be the wisdom in the physics literature. Um, so what we can do is we can actually relax the super selection criterion a little bit. So before I, I demanded unitary equivalence, uh, this I can now uh, relax to 
quasi equivalence. So for those of you that, that are not familiar with this notion, um, this basically means that any irreducible sub-representations of these, uh, so every sub-representation of this one is equivalent to a sub-representation of this one, irreducible sub-representation. So it, it's kind of a, uh, well, it's a weakening of what I demanded before. So what we can show is that if I have a product state, um, so if it's a product state, then I can show that my representation um, is, is, uh, is of this product form. And once we have this, have this, what I can show is that the corresponding superselection structure is trivial. So if I use this representation as my reference representation or ground state representation in my superselection criterion, then any representation that satisfies the criterion is um, is quasi equivalent to this one. So basically means that, that any representation, so there's only one class of representations which contain, which is the vacuum representation or the trivial anion. So that's, um, so that indeed, so what this tells us that if we are in the trivial phase, we don't have any anions uh, according to this. Uh, this so no super selection structure. So in particular, there are no anions. Um, Okay, so I, I, I showed this for a pure state such that, that, well, that this holds. So is it actually true for the whole phase? So if I take my quasi-local automorphism, does the same still hold true? And the answer is yes. Um, if my alpha is called what's called quasi-factorizable. So I'm just going to show the definition with just a picture. So if I can, if I can, um, uh, can factorize my alpha as, as something that only acts in, in this cone. Um, sorry. Yes, only acts in this cone and in, um, uh, sorry, no. So yes, yeah, so only acts in this cone, something that only acts outside and then something that only acts into in this, uh, let me, in this, this region here. So if, if I can map my, my alpha in a map that, that, that does, that, that, that's a sort of uh, local. So it acts locally in this one and outside. And then there's something that, that acts along the edges of these cones. So like this, um, then it's called quasi factorizable. And if we have that, I can show that if you are in the trivial phase, then um, all the states that are related by this quasi-factorizable uh, property have the same superselection structure. So I, I maybe want to stress that that these examples um, that is that I mentioned earlier, where you perturb your system, so under not too strong conditions, you can show that actually they have this quasi-factorizable property. Um, so so that's I think where I I want to uh, want to end. So maybe that. Um, yeah, so, so uh, let me not talk about the split property, but this is related to split property, which is a for Neumann algebraic uh, property um, that, uh, yeah, that, that I won't go into uh, today. But yeah, so this, this in this uh, is, is, uh, is sort of a proof of this, this folklore in, in, uh, in physics that if you have a state that's not long range entangled, then it cannot have a, well, it cannot have elements. So since my time is up, I think I'll leave it with this. Um, so yeah, thanks for your attention. And I see I forgot to answer Ulrich's question. But, uh, I will do that soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. As you can see, Peter has had a really hard job. He had to take us from zero and in sort of fit into a few slides the 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 spin, the spin models, and then cover all this. Uh, it's, it's vast, sort of vast. Uh, I recommend to everybody his uh, his book where this all these statements and strategies are made very explicit. Um, and I have to thank to Peter because uh, uh, it's it's a very illuminating read. Any questions? I'll put the view in.
Yes, I, I think I, I think I can answer the questions in the chat. Uh, so so maybe, yeah. So maybe, maybe first Ulrich's question. So what what does direct sum uh, representation correspond to in the in the picture? So basically, what you, direct sum means that you can write your endomorphism in uh, in this form v one rho a and so rho a v one star plus v two uh, rho two a v two star with um, some, now I have to do it the right way, VI star is the identity and VI star VJ is delta IJ. So you basically have uh, this uh, partial isometry set. Uh, yeah, so this this is the direct sum. So if you look at this in the, in the Hilbert space representation, this is really uh, splitting your, your representation as a direct sum of, uh, of Hilbert uh, space. Um, all right, so uh, maybe the, the next the next question. Um, so naive a technical question. If a reference state has a finite superselection criterion, is uh, the Jones index of the inclusion preserved under quasi-local automorphisms? Uh, that's a very good question. So so maybe uh, for, for those who are not too familiar with this, so so one thing that you can do in this setting is um, it's what's called the Jones index. So this is an, an you have an inclusion of, of Norman algebras and you can define the Jones index which kind of tells you how big one is compared to the other. And in this case, it, it relates to, to the, uh, the sectors. So it gives you a bound on the number of sectors essentially. Um, I don't know yet if this is, if this is stable under applying the, the, the class of local automorphism. So in particular, this is what I briefly mentioned earlier. So the issue is that, that this is something on the Van Neumann algebra level, and it's not so clear how this, uh, um, how this works with this, this quasi local automorphism which are on the C-star algebra level. So I think with this quasi-factorizability, that there's some hope that you can extend this, but we haven't looked into this yet. Um, okay, so we can go down. <laughs> there are yeah. many, many other questions. Yes. Yeah, so, so one answer, one question I think I can answer very quickly. How does this relate to the eight algebra? So this this algebra to non-commutative geometry. Uh, answer is I have no idea. So <laughs> that's that's easy to answer, but maybe not very satisfying. But uh, yeah, that's uh, Emil. Easy. Emil, do you want all questions in the chat, or are you going to also uh, let people no. ask the question? Uh, uh, the hand. <laughs> yeah, I think Sven was earlier uh, with this. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I give it to the chair. <laughs> I think Sven was was uh, before. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, thanks, Peter. I just have a question about this quasi-factorizability. Uh, yes. So maybe you actually already answered the question during the talk. But so you, I, I think you said this property is true for the toric code. But you mean? Did you say that? No. No. No, it's, it's so yeah. So no, it, it's not. It's an, it's a property of the automorphism. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, um, so. Yes. So. So so my question is the following: If you have a yes. gapped system, do you have mm -hmm. any any uh, any conditions for which you have such a quasi-factorizable automorphism to a product state? Ah, to a product state. Um, I mean, so, no product. I mean, a, a yeah, factorized I mean, state. Yeah. So, so that that's so that's his like definition this, yes. of a congruent entanglement. So, if you have such a quasi uh, factorizable build, uh, quasi factor, what's it, quasi factorizable automorphism that that can relate to a, a product state with respect to the cones like this, then this implies that that there's a there's no super selection structure. So, in particular, models such as the Toric code uh, don't have this property. I cannot I cannot uh, I cannot uh, connect them to a uh, a product state like this. So what you can do, and that's that's in the slides that I didn't get to, but um, since you asked the question, this gives me the. That's what I want to talk about. Hear. So, yeah. So 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 you can you can sort of decouple it, but you you will have to you have to sort of delete this part of the system. So if you restrict to this part of the system and outside here, then then it is sort of a product state. So this this kind of says that the state the, the ground set is is entangled and I cannot transform it to to a product state, but it's not entangled too much in the sense that 
if I if I allow something some something non local along the edges here, I can do I can have a, a disagreement. That's sort of what, what happens. Yeah. Okay, I have to admit it's a hard uh, hard job to to moderate <laughs> Q and A <laughs> session. Uh, I'll I'll give the the microphone to Ralph. Um, I'm wondering how this could relate to the classification that we know for vector bundles over a torus. Uh, so in that case, I would expect that the translation symmetry is somewhat important that the ground state might have some, well, might have this translation symmetry, but the results that you get seem to suggest that there's some kind of like a finite system. So these finite quantum groups, this looks more like you don't see a torus and some kind of quasi momentum varying in this model. Yes, uh, yes, that, that's right. So, so it's um, um, so so I, I think I, I'm I'm looking at a slightly different uh, well, slightly different uh, um, a picture. So not not the single particle picture. So we we, we don't look at at the momentum or anything like this. The excitation. So actually. In this model, so the the excitations they are they are not very interesting from a dynamical point of view. So because they're not moving, they're, they're static yeah, in a sense. Um, so yeah, so the translation varies itself. Um, so it doesn't play a role uh, explicitly, but it, it does sort of implicitly because I have this condition that I should be able to move everything around. So this this kind of uh, well, I I mean I don't assume a certain degree of homogeneity, but that, that's that's what you would expect for this to hold. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not quite sure how. Um, so I think I think what you're referring to is, uh, is looking at slightly different things than, than I'm talking about. So um, yeah, yeah. So in the in the usual one particle approximation, uh, well, uh, study then yes, it's uh, very important to vary this quasi momentum, and that's kind of the reason where the non-trivial vector bundles, non-trivial topology comes in, and. It, I don't recognize anything like this in these yeah. constructions. No, no, yeah, that, that's 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 a very that, that's a very different uh, thing to look at. So that's that's something mm -hmm. that which which you would normally more do in this uh, short range entangled phases that I mentioned in the beginning. So I'm not looking at at single particle sectors or anything like this. Um, yeah. Um, so so that yeah so the topology is it, as I said it's it's not clear how this comes in uh, at least not from this picture but um, it basically comes in if you if you look at um, at different ground states, you can look at different boundary conditions, and that's where the topology comes in. But that's not clear in this picture uh, at all, uh, actually. Um, yeah, and I don't think I have the time to explain that. So, yeah. Yeah, what you're doing reminds me more of having some kind of group acting um, on the system which commutes with the Hamiltonian, and then if you look at one fiber of these vector bundles, then they would carry a group action. And there could be different representations of the group. This looks a bit like these tensor categories that you find. Yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. That's that's yeah. So there's definitely, uh, well, not not a group symmetry, but the, the, uh, a quantum double yeah, symmetry uh, behind this. Yeah, yeah quantum uh, group. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's right. That's so in concrete models that that's that's what was behind there. So um, it doesn't show in the in the in the super selection criterion. But uh, once you start looking at the concrete model, that that's how you construct the sectors where you, you use the symmetries uh, like this. That's that's a yeah. Yeah. So uh, then we go down on the chat. Uh, one question is: What is the dependence of dimensionality of the system? Why one and two two D? Yeah. So so if you go to higher dimensions, then if you look at this. Um, systems like this, you can show that there are no anions basically because there's more room to move things around. And in higher dimensions, this, this um, moving one excitation uh, along another one, at least with the same localization properties that I have here, is a topologically trivial operation. So in that case, you don't have this, uh, this anions, but just bonus or fermions. So in two and one dimensions, that's, uh, that's not the case. So that, that's why they're more interesting. Yeah. But I have a question though. There are non-trivial topological field theories in higher dimensions, say in the physical three spatial dimensions. Yeah. And there is a non-trivial non-trivial properties for strings uh, and particles, even though yeah. they're not non-trivial about particles themselves, almost nothing. So have you thought about how to generalize this uh, um, sectors to a case when there are strings around, like topological strings? 
yeah, so so uh, I mean, I think that should be possible. So it it, it but it depends on the on the localization properties that you uh, that you implement. So you can maybe have a localization in I don't know in a uh, in a surface or something like this instead of uh, in a cone. So yeah, so th so that that will be some way uh, one way to do it. So I think for example the uh, so like this higher dimensional toric code models, you can do something like this. I think with uh, membranes or something. Uh, so you have like membrane excitations with strings piercing, I think, for example. Um, so yeah, so so you would have to look at the geometric, uh, or at the localization properties. So that that would be that's basically, uh, yeah, I think what you would have to do. Yeah. So it's not it's not known like what sort of algebraic structure to expect in higher dimension, right? No, no. So uh, no. It, it's, uh, I mean, yes. Yeah, so, so, so you have to you have to change the localization. Yeah. So that, that if if you do that, then all all bets are off. But so, in, in, if you use this coding uh, localization, then then you can show at least in my in, in this setting here that there are no uh, no there's no uh, non-trivial brain. Okay. Yeah. There are yeah. two more questions, and we can take five minutes from the discussion. Are there non-integral examples of MTCs which mm -hmm. you construct using DHR strategy from a quantum spin system? Um, the answer is uh, is I don't know. Um, so 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 I said even though although I don't have to make many assumptions on my model, um, if you want to do a, like a concrete model, uh, you you need to have quite quite a lot of input in it so you, well you need to know quite a lot about about the model specific model to actually do this analysis um so yeah i don't know if this is a way of uh, constructing um non-integral models so that would be very very interesting uh, indeed um yeah but probably uh, i think the sub, sub factor people will, uh, will probably beat me to it <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for talking yeah. about the sub factor thing. But uh, I guess the question is, what goes wrong for like a general eleven win model, right? But where you have non integrality. Um, I, I don't know if anything goes wrong. Um, it just it just gets very complicated to do it explicitly. I think that's something that's been on my to do list for already a few years. I think so. Um, I haven't. Got, yeah. So it, it it gets very complicated. I don't see I don't see anything that. I mean, this this may be because I don't understand it well enough. But I don't see anything that that that. that that could go wrong. So I think it should work, but uh, I don't know for sure. Thanks so yeah. much. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I guess what is difficult is to pinpoint the, the category, which. Yeah, so for the driver members, I think that it should be known what the, what the category should be, but um, yeah. Oh, also uh, to address, I think, uh, I think, I think was it um, Anton, what he was talking about, like the algebraic structure in higher dimensions? Mm -hmm. I think there's this new work of uh, Theo Johnson Fried that talks about these uh, mm -hmm. non-degenerate rated fusion N categories. Um, but so that's certainly something that I, I'm becoming more interested in these days. Yeah, um, yeah it doesn't. Yeah, I just yeah, was definitely more like deriving it from director for, like for, from properties of lattices, like like this endomorphism, for example, from sort of yeah. rated fusion categories, or what sort of the analog of that. Which would give this uh, answers predicted by topological field theory. Yeah, yeah, indeed. That that's yeah. So so there's lots been lots of work in in the abstract setting, just you know, seeing it. Right? It's, it looks like we have these kind of properties. So what mathematical structures do we get? So I, I'm 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 indeed what what Anders is interested in. You know, how do we get from the microscopical system to to this abstract? Setting? So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Then the last question is: uh, You define ground states in terms mm -hmm. of of uh, generators of the dynamics is this in general valid for long range interactions so um so basically you, you need your interactions to, to decay uh, fast enough so um, fast enough basically means that you have a, a liberalism type of of bound for the interactions so that that's that's what you would want otherwise things things don't converge and, and things like that so that's um yeah that that's what i could say about that Maybe I squeeze one one comment from myself. Sure. Yeah. Uh, if I look at the string operators that defines the two uh, the two anions in the mm -hmm. Kitaev model, and Kitaev model has the homogeneity property, 
Now, this string model, it's really a defect that you introduced. <clears throat> uh, it's simply a defect. Mm -hmm. It's a very particular defect, because if we think about there are zillions of our defects, how can we make sure we have actually took into account all the defects which we can imagine uh, for such a system? Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so that actually, so that, that's an interesting question. So that, that actually, that so in this analysis, uh, this this turns out that all well, these models that I can prove it are being quantum double models. You can actually prove that there's nothing else that uh, that that satisfies uh, this super selection criterion. So, so, so the way to prove this is, is through this Jones index that I mentioned earlier, which gives you an upper bound on the representations. So the Gitaev model allows you to, to construct examples of the different sectors, like I, I showed you one, but the other ones that you can construct. Um, and then you can calculate the Jones index. Uh, and then you can show, basically show that the ones that you can construct, they saturate, saturate this bound. Um, so this, then you know you have everything. So uh, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's thank both speakers again, either 